we um, we're going to be opening up full bore, doing the events. It's uh, it's going to be awesome because it's going to be a time, and it is a time of multiplication. You know, we've been having to do things with small numbers because of all the things that have been going on, but now we're going to be able to open up to the events, and uh, it, it's, it, it's, you know, we'll be able to reach large numbers. And we want to win souls. This morning, the message is on the book of life. There's not much taught on the book of life. But it, it means a lot to me. Um, I had the experience of being uh, taken to heaven. And there's a lot of things going on in heaven, but I was taken to a specific place. I did see the city as I was coming in very briefly, but I was specifically taken to a place, and the reason the Book of Life is so uh, meaningful to me is because it is the place where the Book of Life was going to be opened. And it was quite an experience, and it is a blessing to be able to about this the book of life it's the book of life it is the most important book and I want you to understand what I'm about to tell you the book of life is more important than the book of revelations and that's the book that uh, if people are concentrating on. Because you can have the book Revelations memorized verse, verse by verse, word by word. But if your name is not in the book of life, all of that will be in vain. The reason we're ministering on the book of life is because we're going to be reaching a lot of souls. And our approach on the book of life should be, and how we use the book of life, should be in a method and in a way where it brings people to Jesus and God's life flows. Did you understand that? We have a, this trailer, and this is, a, you know, compared to what we were doing, this is a very small trailer, but every Sunday we have what we call Sidewalk Sunday. And in the apartment complex, the kids come. They look forward to their special time. You know, some of these kids really don't have much, and Sidewalk Sunday is a big deal to them. So this is full of food. The refrigerators are full of milk. And kids like milk. There's a lot of milk there. And there's meat. I even saw some, they were like two inch thick T bone steaks. You know, because I was just looking briefly as we were loading it up. So there's some meat, there's a lot of bread, there's cakes. So, we need, this happens suddenly. 
suddenly, I got a phone call. This situation happened with this uh, pickup and delivery situation. And anyway, so we were told that they needed other, they needed, you know, some other organizations to distribute this food. Well, you know, that's us. Us in a men's and women's ministry. So every Sunday, excuse me, every Friday we're going to get a load that we pick up at 4 o'clock. So we're going to need volunteers every Friday. I'm going to need one person to be here with me at 3 30. It'll take a half an hour to get over there. They'll help us load stuff over here, but when we get back, we're going to need at least three volunteers waiting for us here to take the food into the refrigerators, the freezers, and leave the food that needs to be left here. This is a big deal because that means that we will have food every Sunday for all those kids uh, in their families. This is every Sunday. So we're getting back into the swing of things, but even more. Yeah, it's going to bring more kids in. And the, next, and the next deal is this, as we're going back to our once a month events, you know, we usually do them uh, every four to six weeks. And, you know, the food we distribute there is just like a small distribution is 7,000 pounds. So we'll be back on our monthly deal, and it'll be anywhere from 7,000 to 12,000 pounds. Um, for every event, we'll be reaching large crowds. But what are we going to do with them? You, you have been, you know, you, you're being trained and so forth. Our goal is to have a church full of pastors. Say a church full of pastors. That means that if you win somebody to Jesus, got it? Or doing the events, you know, large numbers of people give their hearts to the Lord. We're going to need people that are going to do exactly like my wife said. You're going to call them up. You're going to make sure that, they're, that they have a Bible, that they're getting in the Word. You're going to check up on them. You're going to pray for them. So what we want to do, and this is what we believe that God has put in our hearts, is a church full of pastors. Where you're going to pastor one person, you got it? Our follow-up is going to be different. Can I ask you something? Any of you guys know anything about AA? Do you know why, they're, you know why they're, they've been so successful? They have a program full of pastors. You know what a sponsor is? That's the person that takes care of that person. You got it? Until that person gets to a level where then they can do things on their own. You get it? And then that person's going to take care of somebody else. We're going to be ministering this next Sunday on what is a pastor. What is a pastor? Who were pastors in the Bible? And we're going to follow a pattern that'll take us to the same place that God took them. God is looking for churches full of pastors, not churchgoers.
where people in the church are going to care, they're going to learn how to care, love and protect one-on-one. This will break the glory of God. Now I'm telling you right now in the prophetic anointing, this will transform what we have called church and church membership. The love of God will be poured out in such a way that they will know that we are Christians by our love. God has blessed us with a lot of things. The process is in motion with our retreat center. Ten acres. But we're going to be able to take kids and yes, families that have never, ever done some of the things that they're going to be able to do there. On mid-July, we're supposed to get the word on a very large sum of money. The man representing us is asking for two and a half to five million dollars. We have gone through three levels that you have to go through in an all Three of them, we have gotten an A. We have more finances in the church right now than we've ever had in the history of this church. Somebody told me about a month and a half ago, don't don't tell the people that the church has money because then they won't give. And I rebuked that individual. Supposedly, they were moving under a prophetic anointing. And I told them, we're going to testify when God does things. And if somebody doesn't want to give, then that's in between them and, them, and, them and God. But as far as I'm concerned, I want God on our side. I want to please Him, don't you? Now, we're in a time of reaping. There's going to be opportunities opening up to God's people financially. Right now, I am looking for somebody that can help with two businesses. I'm looking for somebody. Not just anybody. I want a responsible person. You got it? One that's going to be not stupid when they're making money because they're going to make money. But in these two businesses, the resources that are going to come in, how many of you know that once you build a facility like we're going to build here in town, and it's not going to be another build church building. As a matter of fact, the, the least focus has been on the sanctuary. All the focus has been on the programs. We want people to walk into the front door, receptionist. I have a problem with drugs. The receptionist will say, go to door number four. I have a problem with my marriage. Go to door number five. I need dental work. Go to door number eight where there'll be a place where all of the programs, nonprofits that we have been working with, 
You know, that's the beauty about the events. All the other nonprofits come right to the hood. And people can get all the services in one place. They don't have to, tr- you know, you know what it takes to go to three or four different places, driving and appointment. You'll be able to do it right there. But the new facility will be a place where people will walk in and they'll be able to get help in multiple areas. We're going to have an awesome recreational area. For the kids. For the kids. If we get solar or any type of generator, that facility will become an official emergency center. What that means is if anything happens, do you know where the food goes to? The certified emergency centers. We want all of the neighbors and everybody to go, you know, to know that if anything happens, that's the place to go. See, the Bible says, they'll behold your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. You know, people have to know that you give a hoot about them. And sometimes I doubt how much we care about people when you're so focused on putting up a new building And we put up this building, you know, God has blessed us, it's all paid for. But I start wondering, what is the real purpose of that structure? You get where I'm coming from? What is it going to be used for? Now I am going to tell you this. It is going to have a chapel where people, there'll be prayer going on 24 hours a day. It'll be the most beautiful. Let me, I'm not into, you know, spending tons of money to make a building, uh, you know, look like the Taj Mahal. But there's going to be one room that when you walk into that room, there's not going to be talking about anything else. I love Harley Davidson's, but I won't talk about Harley Davidson's in that room. When you walk into that room, it'll be for intercessory. It'll be for prayer and worship to God. The intercessors that will be going in there will have a digital code, and they'll be able to walk in from the outside. It'll have its own restrooms. But we want to provoke God to do something. You know, you mess with God, and he's going to mess with you. We're going to be having a message on provoking God. He's been provoked to be angry. He's been provoked this. But how about when people have provoked him to show up? So there's great things for the glory of God. Great things. If we're faithful with the little things, he'll entrust us with much. In the new facility, we want to have the big walk-in freezers. You know how much food we have to turn away because we don't have the big walk-in freezers? Especially meats. But if we're faithful with a little 10 24-hour prayer going on in worship. And they walk in there because they need walk a straight line. David used to have AIDS. Notice I said used to. He couldn't donate blood. He was on the list. How many times were you checked out, David? So I went to donate my plasma 
And they said, no, because you're on the HIV list. But Jesus healed me, and I've been checked out two times by the Clark County Health District. Once right before, you know, when I was engaged to Joyce, just to be absolutely sure. And uh, I'm free of AIDS. I don't have any AIDS in me. Now, somebody might say, oh, that's impossible. You're going to have a hard time convincing him. <laughs> I called him the last time I called the guy in charge of the whole deal, whatever it was. I don't know what his title was. Was, he the, was it the blood bank or the, the Red Cross? And I loved it. I got the wrestle against unbelief. <laughs> And I remember talking to this man who was not a believer. And I go, well, explain to me how, why it's gone. Was he tested? Yes. More than once? Yes. Because they keep records and all this stuff, you know. And I said, well, tell me how this happened. He goes, I, I said, it's a miracle. Well, uh, and I go, no, give me, okay. Give me the odds. Uh, what are the odds of this happening? Of the test being messed up, of this and that. He wouldn't tell me. He wouldn't talk. He wouldn't say anything. And then I said, 90%? 92? He says, I can't. And I said, but he did have it. For sure, right? Yeah. The, when, he, when he came up on the list, he had it. And now he's been tested twice and he doesn't. What are the odds of the first test being wrong? And he said, well, when, I don't know all the medical terms, but he said, not lightly. And I said, God has done something. If you're believing God for prosperity, imagine being homeless, having AIDS. You know what the Bible says? That he takes the poor and he lifts them up out of the dung hill. You know what dung is? Crap. Out of a hill of crap, he takes the poor and he lifts them up. And he causes them to sit among princes and prince. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm looking for somebody that can go to a school to learn how to do this particular job. So they can help run two businesses. Because I want them to make me and my partners money. So we'll have more money to do things for God. The first business I went into, we had a meeting, crazy meeting, and we said, oh, uh, Jesus, you be our head, see, oh, you're the president of the company. And God bless that company. We were able to do so many things for God. You know that was all written in the book of life? You know that all, all the testimonies we just talked about, you know, they were written in the book of life? Are you ready for the book of life? How do you prosper? You do things for those that have needs. Quit being stupid and sending money to preachers that have conned you and ripped you off for years. 
The latest one, the stone of David. Let me see, we've gone through the holy water. And by the way, we used to talk bad about the Catholics. Then you find the full gospel people. What the, if you just divide a little of oh, holy water. We've sold the anointing oil, little bottles of anointing oil. You know, a lot of people are going to split hell wide open with minister's license. I don't know if you know that. Then, oh, we won't charge you anything, but then you get on the mailing list, and guess what? No, it didn't cost anything for the stone or for whatever. God, let me tell you guys something. I'm going to have to share with you guys. I wasn't even thinking about this stuff. Years ago, I was spending time with God, and God spoke to me about this nonsense, what he was going to do. It's going to shock you. Can you say nonsense, boys and girls? I thought you could. I want to read you a prayer from a, a diary from a man of God that really loved Jesus. I have this basket of personal notes from men and women of God, great men and women of God. You know what they all had in common? They all loved the poor. It, it was amazing to me. That's what stood out as I started reading. I wonder how much we really love the poor. More than fame. More than having a name. More than having the top book in the Christian market. You know that Jesus guaranteed us one thing. He said, you'll always have the poor. You know why? He died so we could help people that are in need. He didn't die so we could have mansions. That, although you can have mansions, as long as you do it right. But the main reason is to set the captives free. I want to read you. This is from a personal diary. Oh God, renew our spirit by your Holy Spirit and draw our hearts unto yourself that our work may not be a burden. but a delight. Let us not serve as slaves with the spirit of bondage, but with freedom and gladness as your children, rejoicing in your will. And I love how he ended it. For Jesus' sake. Answer this prayer for Jesus' sake. Every single one of them, whether they were a man or a woman, that's what they had in common. That's what they had in common. And I'm going to do this message in 10 minutes. You have your papers, the book of life. First, we're going to include the women right off the bat. And I entreat thee also, true yoked fellow, help those women which labor with me in the gospel. Help them.
But I don't believe in that. I'm, uh, I'm the head of the house. You better be the head of the house by praying more than your wife and loving Jesus more than your wife and your kids. You better be the head of the house. Praise God by leading that household. Oh, don't, don't you start claiming that you're the head of the house. You might be the man of the house. Have we settled that question? Yes, you're the head of the house. You're like Jesus. It's over, the, and the woman represents the church. And the, oh, I know all that stuff, but I'm waiting for somebody that cares and that's doing what they're supposed to be doing out of the right heart. That's what we come to church for, for the Spirit of God. Let me tell you something. If you go to church and your will isn't challenged to change, go eat a donut. Go to Winchell's. When you come to church, our will is supposed to change. Uh, see, that's just me. That's just the way I was taught, you know. Which labor with me in, in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. You know that laborers' names are in the book of life? The book of life. Next verse, Revelation 3, 5. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not, I will what? Blood out his name out of the book of life. You know that your name can be blooded out? I don't care what your doctrine is. That's what the word says. Now, let me interpret this for you. It can be written in, and it can be blooded out. Did you get that? Oh, I gave my heart to Jesus. I can do whatever I want. I'm still going to heaven. You know, we'll see. Somebody's got to fall into that category where he said, oh, didn't we do this in your name and all that stuff? And he said, I never knew you. Say what? I never knew you. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Some will be blotted out. Don't you go with me with all your cute little scriptures? That is plain. I don't care how many scriptures you come up with. And that is the book of life. The price Jesus paid shouldn't be treated like some cheap piece of trash. Next, now, now that's John, right? We have Paul, that was the first verse. We have John in the book of Revelation. And now we have David, Old Testament. Let them be blooded out of the book of the living. David knew about that book. You cannot get close to God and not know about the book of life. This is David now talking about, let let them be blotted out of the book of, uh, of the living and not be written with the righteous. I guess that's pretty clear. Next verse, Revelation 22, 19. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of... Can it be taken out? But now he's going to really make the point clear. And out of the holy city. So if it's taken out of the book of life, then it's taken out of the holy city. And from the things which are written in this book, the blessings. 
that are written in the book. The book of Revelation isn't curses all, all, all up and down. You better watch which scriptures you're claiming, by the way. So we have established that it can be what? Revelation 20.15 And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I, silly me preaching about hell. How dare me with our culture today. You're going to see culture when we stand in front of Jesus. We're going to see some of these culture situations get all straightened out real quick without an election. Without a politician. Hallelujah. Oh, Jose, can't you just be a nice little preacher? Come on. I, went, I wanted to be petted this morning. Tell you what you need. It's a couple of good real trials to straighten you up. Oh, pastor. I was praying in tongues one day for a long time. I didn't know what I was praying. And the Bible says you can pray for an interpretation, you know. And I pray for an interpretation of what I was praying. You know what I was praying? I shut my mouth so quick. I was praying that I needed to be tried and tested. And I went, ah, why did I pray for an interpretation? I'm not lying. I stopped it. I didn't want the rest of it. All I got, I just got to the part to be tied and tested so I could be more like. Now, let Brother Moses knew about this book, Exodus 32, 32. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sins, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of the book which thou hast written. Moses knew about the book, didn't he? Blot out my what? He was interceding for a group of people that never entered the, into the promised land. Let me tell you something. I will step over your dead carcass and dance into the promised land and you can stay out in the wilderness. I will say it again. I will jump over you and right into the promised land. You know Moses made a mistake. Hallelujah. Oh, Pastor, I wish I would have listened to Brother Marshmallows this morning instead of coming here. <laughs> now, look at God's authority here. Next verse, what he tells Moses. You know, some people read these verses like Moses was more loving than God, that he was smarter than God. Oh, and he caused the Lord's hands. Was... You know what God told him? We're about to find out. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. He took it right out of Moses' hand, didn't he? Let me tell you something, Moses. That's my book. I'm the one that makes the decisions. Who gets blotted out and who doesn't. Revelation 13, 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of what? Life of the Lamb. There's three types of people in the world. Listen. Those that will accept Jesus. Those that will never accept Jesus. And those that will accept Jesus and fall away. And in that same category, those that will fall away and come back. There's only three groups. Pharaoh was in the group that would never come to God. You want to know why? You know what predestination is? God knows the end of your free will. He doesn't make you go to hell. He doesn't... But you know what he knows? He knows the end of your free will. And because he knows the end of your free will... He knows where you're going to end up. But he does not say, you're going to hell and you're going to heaven. 
you're going to have doo-doo and you're going to have flowers. Did you understand that? But he knows the end of your free will. That's how he knows all this stuff. But he never forced anybody. But he knows the end of your free will. We don't even, I don't even know the end of my free will. He does. Are you ready? And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundations of the world. Jesus was slain from the foundations of the world. You wonder how long Jesus carried the cross? From the beginning. He knew he would have to die and pay for the sins of the people before anybody ever sinned. Listen to, to this. Written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of what? How long did Jesus carry the cross? Long time. And then he finally faced it in the garden. That's why it was the battle of battles. Let me tell you something. Jesus knew about him being slain. But he had never experienced it until the nails went through. Because he had never been a man before. That was the time to experience it. And he did it for you and me. For you and me. Slain from the foundation of what? I only have four verses left. Revelation 17, 8. The beast that thou saw with was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition and they that dwell upon the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book from the foundation of what? Of the world. When they behold the beast that were that was and is not yet. Did you get that? Do you know that this is how we should be witnessing to people? Are you ready? Watch this. Do you know that your name is already written in the book of life? Do you want it blotted out? Then guess what? Confirm your reservation. Your names are already written. Already. Don't have it blooded out. That's a different approach, isn't it? Now those that will be erased will be those that knew him. You know that he actually said, it's better that you never knew me than if you knew me and forsake me. Why do we have to preach this? It's the word. But you know what? I'm, but, but we're going to get to the good part. Turn, turn to your neighbor and say, don't take that aspirin. <laughs> Ushers, we got a guy down on the third row. Bring the shock treatment and let him ha have a few to the chest because he almost died on us. Are you ready? When they... Romans 8, 29, I'm going to give it to you. What is predestination? There's so much baloney about predestination. Listen to this. I'm going to give it to you in three verses. Are you ready? For whom he did 
Forkno, he also did what? Predestined from the foundations of the world. To be com what? Conform to the image of his son. You know what you're predestined? You know what you, you know? You want to know what your predestination is? To be conformed to the image of Jesus. If you're living like the devil, and guess what? You better, you better watch your predestination, which one it is. God loves us. He'll forgive us. Hallelujah! But it's up to us. Those of you watching over the internet, those of you that are here, praise God, before we step into the next Sunday's message, we have to know that this is covered. For whom he did, uh, for, for, no, he knew ahead of time, he also did predestine to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many what? Brethren, Jesus is always number one. But guess what? We're predestined to be like Jesus. Say, that's my predestination. I understand predestination fully now. Next verse. Moreover, whom he did predestine, then he also called. You're called to be like Jesus. That's our first calling. To be conformed to his image. And whom he called, then he also what? Justified. You've been justified. And whom he justified, then he also what? Glorified. Last verse. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be what? Against us. Hallelujah. I've been predestined to be like Jesus. I've been justified. He that has begun a good work in me is... You know what I believe? I believe that once saved, you can stay saved. There's a new one. You can fall in love with Jesus. He is for us. And we can be all that God said we could be. And what is that? Like Jesus. Predestined to be like Jesus. Not predestined to all this other nonsense. They're not playing enough, Kenny, you know. We just tell people what? Just be like Jesus. Oh, no, that's not deep enough, brother. You need to tell me the angle of the dangle and the gravitational pull of a donkey's ears at midnight tomorrow. Touch your people, God. Swallow us up in the image of Christ. Clear the debris. I can be like Jesus. There's only one Jesus. But I can be like him. And if you mess up, he'll forgive you. All you got to do is say, I mess up. I claim being predestined. This part of me is going to be like Jesus. I don't know how. But that's why I have to depend on you, God. So I want to... Right now, if you've never given your heart to Jesus, you need to do it immediately. You know what Paul put it, how he put it, the apostles put it? 
Behold, the time of salvation is now. That means let's get it on. If you've been away from the Lord, let's get it on. He loves you. Who shall ever call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Hallelujah. 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 Possess us, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, we surrender it. We surrender to a point that even the areas that, have, that we tried to surrender before, we re-surrender. And Lord, if we have to re-surrender, ten minutes from now we'll re-surrender again. Satan, we want you to know that we are surrounded and we surrender. Look up here for a moment. They'll never forget this. If you surrender to God, the devil has to surrender to you. Because what has surrendered to God is God's. And anything that comes against it has to surrender to the will of God. If you surrender to God, principalities and powers are surrendered to you. Hallelujah. Are you ready? Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Go tell people that their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Don't mess it up and blot it out, dude. Yes. 